Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Tina McCain, the Development Associate here at MAS, and I am thrilled to have everyone join us for this afternoon's program, Exploring History and Advocacy at the People's Beach at Jacob Rees Park. Before we begin, I'd like to direct your attention to the chat where MAS staff has placed some helpful tips, including information about closed captioning for the program. If you need any assistance during the event, feel free to message MAS using the chat function. Throughout the event, we invite you to use the Q&A fu function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions to our panelists. We will answer these questions throughout the event, plus at the end of the program. The People's Beach is nestled all the way on the eastern side of Jacob Reese Park on Bay One, hugged by the abandoned Neponset Medical Center. At the very top of the building, three spray-painted words are visible, queer trans power. This isolated end of the beach has been a haven for LGBTQ New Yorkers dating back to the 1940s, and queer folks still come to Reese in droves every summer to cruise, sunbathe, and be in community with one another. The Neponset Hospital near the People's Beach opened in 1915, operating as a hospital and then later a nursing home before closing in 1998. Since then, the nearby beach, which is federally owned, has continued to be a thriving community and haven for beachgoers. This past spring, the New York City Public Hospitals Agency announced that the abandoned medical center would be demolished after the end of the 2022 beach season. The land would then be turned over to the city's Department of Parks and Recreation, eventually becoming a park with a space for a parking lot and facilities for lifeguards. To find for more information about the project, check out a recent article in the city linked in the chat. Additionally, the Department of Health and Hospitals provided MAS with a fact sheet about the project, which is also linked in the chat. Organizations and individuals in the People's Beach community, including folks joining us today, are working to protect the beach community at Jacob Rees Park. This afternoon, while exploring the history and advocacy of the beach, we will ponder how we can document, celebrate, and protect community spaces at the People's Beach and beyond. Now I am thrilled to introduce today's panelists. Ken Lusbader is a co-founder and co-director of the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project, an award-winning cultural heritage initiative that is documenting and memorializing LGBT place-based history in New York City. For almost 30 years, he has been a national leader in issues related to LGBT history, documentation, and historic preservation. Kayan Dorsho is a compassionate powerhouse performer, activist, organizer, community-based researcher, and public figure in the trans and sex worker rights movements. As the founder and executive director of GLITS, she worked to provide holistic care to LGBTQ sex workers while serving on the following boards, SWOP Behind Bars, Caribbean Equality Project, and the SOAR Institute. Jalav Serrano is a health educator, youth advocate, HIV AIDS activist, androgynous model, runway coach, drag queen, background dancer, and choreographer to the stars. He works hard on a global, national, city, and local level to address the needs of HIV positive and negative youth. Jalav also serves as the president of the advisory board at Blitz. Katie Honan is a reporter for the city. Previously, she covered City Hall for the Wall Street Journal and Neighborhoods in Queens for dnainfo.com. She also worked as a social media editor at NBC4 New York. A Queens native, Honan graduated from St. John's University and the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY. Annie Yetzi is a multimedia journalist who first enjoyed the shore at Reese in 2018. As a relative newcomer to the People's Beach, Annie's work there has prioritized informing the public on the community response, resistance, and queer legacies that define the stretch of sand in front of Neponset Hospital. She's currently a fellow on the NPR shows White Lies and Embedded and an associate producer at Palisades Media Ventures as she finishes her master's degree in journalism at NYU. Chris Bernstein is a New Orleans, New York-based artist. His lens-based practice explores themes related to queerness, intimacy, and history. 
Chris's work has been exhibited at institutions such as MoMA PS1, Aperture Foundation, New York, the Ogden Museum of Southern Art, and the Contemporary Art Center, New Orleans. He received his BFA from New York University's Tisch School of the Arts and his MFA from Hunter College. So thank you so much to all of our panelists for being here today. We are thrilled to have um, incredible panel, this incredible panel assembled for today's conversation. Uh, before we engage in our larger group conversation moderated by MAS's Director of Advocacy, Spencer Williams, each group of panelists will lead an individual presentation, lending their unique perspectives to ponder how we can designate, defend, and document the people's beach. First, I'm happy to introduce our first panelist, Ken Lesbader of the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project, who will be discussing how Reese developed into the space that it is today, why it is a necessary space, and looking back at its history. Great. So I am assuming you can hear me and you could see my screen and I'm going to just eliminate the box on the right, which is distracting. Great. So I'm sorry I can't see everybody in the audience, but I'm Ken Lusbader, co-director of the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project. Um, as said, we're a cultural heritage initiative and educational resource documenting the city's LGBTQ place-based history from the 17th century to the year 2000. Our goal is to make an invisible history visible. And I'd like to thank the MAS and my co-participants for the opportunity to discuss free speech as an important queer historic landscape and how it will be impacted by the demolition of the hospital complex. I'm going to first provide a brief overview of the foundational history as a queer destination. First, I'll look at the history of the beach itself, then explore its queerness from 1940s to the 1970s. This will provide context for the ensuing discussion by others who will address its more recent LGBTQ history. Okay. So why is LGBTQ history important? Um, as you can see from this map, we've documented over 400 sites, including Reese, um, and we're working to ensure that LGBTQ history is recognized, valued, and not erased. In addition to our research, we present uh, public programs throughout the year and nominate sites for official landmark recognition. Please visit our website and learn more about our project via social media. So, LGBTQ people, often by necessity, have gathered and at times appropriated public spaces for socializing, protest, public celebrations, community organizing, and sex. In the city, we have documented a limited number of these streetscapes and landscapes. These locations were often located on the edges of populated areas, desolate at night, and shielded with limited accessibility by structures and infrastructure. Reese Beach has been well documented as a gathering spot for the LGBT community since the 1940s and had, may have had a gay presence even earlier. It's one of the city's most historic LGBTQ landscapes. In 1974, the beach was transferred from the city to federal jurisdiction and remains overseen by the National Park Service. It was listed on the National Register for Historic Places in 1981. Historically, New York City's beaches, including Orchard, Coney Island, and Reese, have been popular public social gathering spaces for the LGBTQ community, where they claimed certain sections of the beachscape as their own. In the period before Stonewall, beaches were especially important gathering spots, since there were few public spaces that existed outside of commercialized bars for LGBTQ people to meet and socialize. Historically, bars, mostly operated by mob control and organized crime, were discriminatory to people of color, to black people, women, and today's terminology, people who would be considered trans, gender fluid, and gender variant. Beaches, while surveilled and monitored, provided opportunities for people to create community, develop friendships and partnerships, and simply recognize each other's queerness on their own journeys. The beach property developed in the late 19th century was acquired by the city in 1912 through the efforts of Jacob Rees, the turn of the century social reformer and photojournalist. In the 1930s, the beach was redesigned under the direction of Robert Moses. When the park reopened in 1937, it would be lauded as a public amenity that was accessible by affordable public transportation. 
In the 1940s, the eastern end of the beach abutting the hospital complex to its north and the Neponset residential community to its east was a known destination for mostly white gay men to sunbathe and cruise. There's no documentation why this section was selected, but as with many other queer beaches or destinations, it's on the periphery of the public space and somewhat shielded by a, from other beachgoers. The red arrow indicates the area of the hospital buildings that are proposed for demolition. These are on the city owned property in contrast to the beach, which is still federally owned. The Neponset Beach Hospital for Children was designed by McKim Mead and White and opened in 1915. It was located and designed for the care and treatment of children with airborne illnesses such as tuberculosis. Other buildings were constructed through the 30s as were many alterations to these buildings. These images show the terraces and roof spaces that took advantage of the complex's location by the sea. Efforts to have the complex demolished for parkland are documented as early as 1955. In 1998, the Giuliani administration proposed demolition as well. In contrast to today, in 1998, none of the news coverage addressed the history and importance of it as a queer destination. <clears throat> Today, the buildings are a collection of ruins. However, they still provide a buffer by creating a somewhat defensible public-private space. Like the plywood back windows of Stonewall that shielded bar patrons from the public gaze, the buildings have protected beachgoers from interlopers and established a sense of place for decades. As mentioned, Reese was a destination for men as early as the 1940s. Lesbian women claimed the nearby section of the beach in the 1950s. And by the 1960s, the beach became increasingly popular for a diverse LGBTQ presence, including Black and Latinx men and women. These 1960s guidebooks include references about the beach. New York, New York Unexpurgated mentions Reese as, quote, one of the gay Rivieras of the world, so crowded, nudes go unnoticed. Other guides gave specific instructions on how to find the queer section when arriving at the beach. You could see that in both these texts here. And it was during this, pit, this period that the queer section was known for its clothing optional appeal and was affectionately referred to as Screech Beach. Remarkably, like many other aspects of queer life during the 1940s and 50s and 60s, there is some limited photo documentation of beach going. This image on the right from the Lesbian Her Story archives shows women on the beach in the 1960s. On the left is a flyer from 1972, which lists various services for women, including Reese as a destination. The popularity of Reese is evident in this photo on the left of the crowded beach in 1960, taken by activist Randy Wicker. And Reese is also a destination for sexual freedom and gender expression, that, which was documented in the 1960s with this photograph on the right. Richard B., an anonymous beachgoer, took various photographs in the 1960s, mostly of beachgoers and many of nude men uh, on the beach. Reese was also a place for early political connections and activism. Pre Stonewall, the Daughters of Belitis, a lesbian rights group established in the 1950s, advertised a beach outing in 1968. The Gay Activists Alliance, um, Pre Stonewall, the Gay Activists Alliance, formed six months after the uprising, had a 1971 voter registration drive there. Its softball ball team gathered for a beach outing. Through the 1970s, Reese, as a beloved queer destination, took hold despite efforts to intimidate beachgoers after its transfer to federal ownership in 1974. At that time, it became much more difficult to sunbathe nude, and federal officers would monitor the beach for nudity, often issuing warnings or summonses for people who were simply holding hands or kissing. Since the 1970s, Reese has flourished as a beach for all queer people of different gender expressions, races, and classes, although not without problems of discrimination and surveillance. I started with, and I'm going to end with this photograph, which captures the love, joy, friendship, and fun at Reese in 1972, 50 years ago this summer, that is still thriving today. It was sent to the project by David Bolt, who for 34 years was lovers with Felix, shown here on the left as Carmen Miranda. David wrote that they would gather with friends on the beach for a well-deserved respite from the heat and oppression of early 1970s New York City. 
David wrote that Felix was born in Brooklyn in 1951 and that everyone in this photo has passed away. This snapshot is our archival record. Queer representation and history matter. Reese Beach is a historic queer location that needs to be valued and protected in the redesign of the proposed adjacent park space. Once these buildings are demolished, the area and beachgoers will be more vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, our next panelists are Cayenne uh, Dorosho and Jalav Serrano of the organization Glitz. They will be discussing the role of Glitz in working to defend the people's beach as a protected sanctum of queer culture, history, and community. Hi, everybody. I'm Cayenne Dorosho, the founder of Glitz, Inc. Um, ja, are you on? I'm on. Hi. Um, so, um, you know, this land means a lot to us. It means a lot to not only Glitz, but when community reached out to me and to Glitz, it became evident that there were two things that were going to happen, that our community were going to chain themselves to the fence to prevent the closure of or the demolishment of that <laughs> hospital because it would mean erasure for us. Two, that we needed to organize by having a focus group, which Ja led and, and, and did a phenomenal job of organizing, close that back door, of organizing and getting community to figure out where their place was in organizing around this. We had the help of Chris Bernstein and all of Chris's fabulous, fabulous photos that date back post the, the 60s. And we had other organizers participate. We had Hester Street Foundation, which built a land trust in California uh, um, around a black beach in California. We're not taking away the history of the beach and white men. This beach primarily has been a white beach where white men have idolized, um, what is the word, idled, Googled, whatever. But white men have not only felt us up, just have done the most egregious things to us on this beach. And we have had no presence as, as you have heard until the 70s. Uh, we were on that beach way before the 70s. My uncle who passed away, who worked for the White House, Charles Jackson, told me about that beach back in the early 70s. And he used to go to the beach as a young man, it being one of New York's hot spots for queer life in New York. And as a global acknowledgement that this beach was known around the world. John? Um, thank you, Kyan. Um, so when we when Glitz held a town hall meeting, which was on April 9th, um, and nowadays, we had a strong president of community rallying around us. And I want to be very clear, when it comes to um, prioritizing and having safe spaces, it's always led by black and brown trans women. And we could talk about uh, our rights. And so for Glitz to take on this as Cayenne being the CEO and creative Glitz, it is it is very it's very monumental. So I want to just talk about like some of the key pointers and pillars that came out from the town hall meeting, which we started a petition, which if you go on the Glitz website, which we'll put in the chat, that you'll be able to sign the petition because we still need um, signatures on that. Uh, we prioritize people, access, accessibility, outreach, and um, and prep. So we talked about um, saving, saving the stories and, and prioritizing, especially black and brown stories at Reese Beach, because it seems like it's non-existent. But if you go on the beach, still to the day, you see a slew of black and brown people. And it's just, it's just a great people beach. Um, what came out of that town hall meeting was that we have to preserve, reserve, and that's why we have having also this, this Zoom meeting. The people were really shocked. Um, the people that attended was really shocked that there was just no noise around rallying about saving the safe space until Glitz definitely was um, put it on the forefront. Um, some of the notes that have taken that I've, that I've taken from leading leading that workshop was that we know that policy and politics is going to be our 
our game changer here, right? Um, and also having the community involved, right? Because the Rockaways have their own communities. And so knowing that we need more allies than just us showing up to preserve this space. And so I'm really looking forward to the rest of this um, presentation and what the other panelists have to bring and also the audience watching. But just know that I would definitely uh, get the link to put into the chat because we still need those signatures. It's there. I want to be clear that in organizing this, we were thrown slogans from city officials from, oh, well, you have Stonewall. Stonewall has never been for people of color still today. Stonewall gives us very little access. As a black trans woman, I'm still not welcomed in Stonewall. I'm policed by queer white men in Stonewall. We have a little triangle park. That park doesn't even resemble us. We have three white statues in there, which tell us we are not welcomed or thought of. When we're talking about turning this into a land trust and landmark, it's about preserving spaces for people that look like me, for people that look like Ja, for people in general, but designed to protect Black and brown bodies in these spaces when right now we have federal police and parks police looking at us, observing us and arresting us and ticketing us at this moment. And we're having that conversation with the police department next week. We're organizing around the Rockaways community, trying to preserve the history, but also work together with them. It is a land desert. We support everything that they basically want. What we are asking for is accessibility. We're asking for that land to be ours. We're asking for handicap ramps. We're asking for bathrooms. When you look at gentrification all over New York City, they're about to build another luxury hotel in that space over a bathhouse that we can't even get to. As a senior, if I have to go to the bathroom, I have to time it. We're looking for the accessibility to be right on that land. You can have your lifeguard station, but give us a health and wellness center. Let people heal while they're going to that space. This is what we're looking for out of the city of New York. This is what we're looking for from participants and government and policyholders to create a safer space that's already been ours. We just need it legally dame the people's beach and preserved for us. Thank you so much, um, Kayan and Jalove. Um, our next panelists are journalists Katie Honan and Annie Yetzi. They will be discussing the documentation of the evolving land use discussion at the beach and how it came to their attention as journalists. Thank you for having us, Tina, and thank you to everyone here. I'm Annie. It's nice to see you all. Um, so Reese actually came to my attention the same way that it has for generations of beachgoers, like Kyan said, by word of mouth. Someone told my longtime roommate about it. She then told me that there was this mostly queer de facto nude beach in the Rockaways. So we went then in the summer of 2018, and we haven't stopped going back. That stretch of shore in front of Neponset Hospital is a place of tremendous joy for me, as I know it is for so many other New Yorkers, ones who've been here much longer, like many of you mentioned. I want to acknowledge that my presence at the People's Beach as a sunbather and as a journalist is part of what's changing it. Bay One has for decades been a place of community, particularly for trans and queer people of color. The incomparable author and activist Audre Lorde wrote about it in her 1982 book, Zami, a new spelling of my name. She talks about the fact that queer spaces in New York have always winked in and out of existence and points out that most of them are bars, dark and closed off. But then there's Reese. Muriel and I had come back that day from Reese Park, she writes, full of sun and sand. We loved with the salt still on our skins. Mine was tan from the sun and burnished ruddy with the heat and much loving. I want to thank the queer elders and contemporaries who've pioneered the joy of existing in community at the People's Beach, bearing both skin and soul. News of the city plan to demolish the hospital came somewhat less beautifully. Late in the summer of 2021, I got curious about that crumbling building behind the sand decorated with queer graffiti, and I fell into a Googling hole. A recently created petition to save free speech came up pages down in my search, 
and I hadn't known that it was actually threatened this time. Like many said, the city has had plans to demolish Nippons at hospital for years. It had never actually happened before. Since then, I've come across several petitions, community groups, organizing to have a say in the fate of the beach in the adjoining plot, and people who just want to make sure that they can still find solace there when the building is gone. Katie and I have been working together to journalistically document this story. From my end, documenting the beach, its past and future, is really about documenting the people who call Reese home. That means attending and taking notes at community meetings like the one Glitz hosted, town halls, Zooms and organizing assemblies, knocking on doors of nearby homeowners for a whole day, and of course, speaking with the people at the beach itself. I met one woman, Victoria Cruz, who's been going to the People's Beach since 1963. She told me that convalescent patients from the hospital used to frolic with the beachgoers, enjoying the healing power of the ocean. Daniela Simba, a trans blogger, told me at the Glitz Town Hall that Reese is the only place she can go without hiding parts of herself, physically and mentally. Sharing these stories with the wider public is one way to preserve the beach without already relegating it to the past. And I'd add that I see lots of people documenting the changing story of Reese on their social media platforms, sharing photos, organizing actions, boosting petitions and articles. These real-time testaments spread the existence of Reese further. Finally, I'll say that celebration, even fleeting, is itself a type of document. I'll be writing about the fourth annual Miss Columbia Walk on the beach later this month. The walk is the Reese community's way of reanimating the NYC queer icon spectacular life, and the community itself will remain a lasting document of the people's beach, no matter what happens to the Neponset plot. Now I'll throw it to Katie, who's a Rockaway native and reported out a lot of the local opinion and city stakeholder information that we've covered. Thanks. Thank you so much, Annie, and of course, everyone for coming to this and, and speaking before us. Um, my name is Katie Hone, and I'm a reporter for the news website, The City. And when Annie came to us with this great story, you know, I knew we, we wanted to collaborate and work on this just because I understand just the significance to so many different aspects of New Yorkers that Reese Park and Bays 1 up through Bay 9, but particularly Bay 1, 2, and 3 hold to so many people. Um, so when reporting this, you know, I, I've always been fascinated since 1998, the history of, of this former hospital turned nursing home, and it always sort of stood to me as an example of the city's disinvestment, historical disinvestment into the peninsula, but I know it's also been reclaimed by a very important faction of New Yorkers to be significant to them in protecting them and shielding them from their queer beach. Um, so why that... Uh, why it was closed in 1998. It was actually Labor Day 98, and there was a, a horrible storm that hit New York City. Um, and then Mayor Giuliani said that it was in danger of, of, of collapsing. Um, and he moved more than 100 residents of this nursing home in the middle of the night to other places around the city. And it was a huge story at the time because the mayor had... Um, there was reporting that showed he wanted to privatize the city's public hospital system with this nursing home as part of it. And this was sort of one way he was doing it. So as you can all see, it's been um, more than 20 years since and it still stands. It survived major hurricanes, including Hurricane Sandy. So Giuliani, maybe, uh, maybe that was a trick on his part to get people out of there. But it's been empty ever since. And the difference in, I know Annie, you mentioned, you know, there's been talk of demolition for years. The difference now, like what you see in a lot of city things, is um, as it's beginning to deteriorate, there were pieces of the roof that were falling into homes. And I do think that the city, and what I've been told, is that they were really just afraid of litigation. You know, they probably would have kept it up there for a long time, but they're afraid that some storm is going to blow a piece of the roof onto a person or a home and it's going to be a lawsuit or could be dangerous. So that is what is really pushing this demolition. And because of the specific deed that the land is on. Um, there was concern from lots of people, both locals in Neponset and also people who go to Bay One of what could be placed there. So there are limits to what could be built there. The plan now is what's called a passive park, which means no you know, playground equipment. Um, I know that a lot of people, a lot of activists have other ideas for it. And I know that there will be some kind of envisioning um, and visioning sessions, but demolition is set to begin at the end of the summer. Um, I know the concern for a lot of people now is what that demolition will look like, um, knowing when the building was built, a lot of asbestos, so there's concerns of it being a health hazard, but um, it will be taken down very slowly is my 
understanding, but this building means so much to people. And it also sort of has stood as a testament to a lot of different things um, to a lot of people. But I, I know there are even locals in Neponza who just didn't even want to take it down either because they know that the process of demolition can be so uh, detrimental. But we'll, what we'll see, I guess, over the next couple of months is how that demolition will happen. And then of course, what happens after. I know there are a lot of different, and I hate this word, but stakeholders, people who really are interested in what can happen in this historic piece of New York City. Um, and, and going forward, we'll see how that plays out, you know, who gets involved and, and whose voices are actually listened to in terms of what gets built there, if anything gets built there at all. All right, thank you so much, uh, Katie and Annie. Um, our last panelist is uh, photographer Chris Brinson, who will be discussing how we have photographed race speech as it has evolved and changed over time, and what um, photographing the people's beach means to him. Great. Okay, well, thank you for uh, managing the slides. Um, so my name is Chris Bernson, and I am a photographer and a longtime re-speech goer. Um, I first went to the beach uh, and just happened to bring my camera. And the first person I met at the beach was Miss Columbia. And I asked if I could take her picture. And she said yes, because she always said yes to everyone. And it wasn't a great picture, but it did start the process for me of falling in love with this beach as a place, uh, both as a queer person and as an image maker, as a photographer. Um, so what we're looking at right now is just the average uh, beach day. You know, this is this is almost not a crowded day at the beach. You know, you can actually even see some sand. Um, and it's so funny because when you go outside of what we call the gay section of the beach, it, it's almost like there's like tumbleweeds on one side and then the other side is just bodies, just queer bodies everywhere. Um, can we move to the next slide? Um, one thing I do want to mention so far um, is that uh, Reese Beach is named after a photographer, Jacob Reese, um, who was a muckraking journalist. He wrote and took photographs. Um, he produced a book that was called How the Other Half Lives that documented tenement conditions in New York City. Um, I am so fascinated. And I think it's such... Um, such luck for me that this beach that I love is named after a photographer. Um, now, the difference between Jacob Reese, who was making images in 1910, 1915 in New York City, and what I'm doing 100 years later, and what many photographers are doing, there's so many amazing people taking pictures at Reese right now, um, is that Reese photographed conditions that he wanted to see not exist in the world. Um, and I and many other people are actually photographing things that they want to see continue to exist. So what we want to see continue to exist is a safe uh, place for queerness uh, to exist, such as Reese. This is an image from a few years ago at Reese at Twilight. Um, this was a gentleman that I didn't know at the time, and he was generous enough to let me make a picture with him. Um, can we move to the next slide? This is a picture by Richard Peckinpah, presumably in the 1960s. Um, now, I, unlike other people on this panel, uh, am interested in documentary work, but also interested in kind of querying the ideas of those things. The details and the specifics are not completely, I don't feel beholden to uh, exact details. So the fact that I don't know exactly when this picture was made doesn't really bother me so much, but it is made at Reese Beach. Um, and so what I'm seeing in working with these archives, as well as my own images, is that I'm seeing um, people that have been doing the work that I've been doing for decades. And um, I'm so interested in, in continuing that conversation. Can we move to the next slide? Um, so in my practice, I work with these archives as well as my own contemporary images. And I love that Ken had the picture that is uh, fractured that is on the left in um, his presentation. Um, I love this image. It's iconic. Um, and it's it's also presumably from the 60s as well um, of this person at the beach. And I saw it and it just got burned into my memory. I was, I was digitizing this archive by Richard Peckinpah. Um, I have fully documented or scanned a thousand pictures that he's made 
And I just said, you know, I need to recreate this. And in doing that, what I'm really interested in is taking images that were made from the same exact location, but captured decades apart and bringing them back together. Because I feel, even though it's not like a fact, it's a feeling that, um, that time is not quite then and now, but it's actually something of a continuum. So I, I feel the then in the now. Um, and this is just one way that I tried to represent that. Um, these images are made uh, 50 or 60 years apart. That's, that's amazing, but in the same location. Can we go to the next slide? Here's another collage that I made, and this is with two archival images and one that I made more recently myself. The center image is by Richard Peckinpah, presumably in the 1960s, and the next one, the color image, is from presumably the 1980s by a photographer named Frank Hallam, who also lived in New York. And I lined up the water lines, and I was just really interested in working with that that very specific constraint of uh continuing you know the 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 geographic continuity of the space but just done over these this span of time so this is a portrait from 50 or 60 years of time at the beach can we go to the next slide I love this picture. This is also by Richard Peckinpah. We can see the building is in working order and it's pristine. And something that I think Kyan and Jot Love were talking about that feels really important to note here is Richard Peckinpah was a cisgendered white photographer who in his archive is, I feel, mostly looking to uh, capture and document and in some ways maybe eroticize um, the body of the cis man at the beach but when you look at his some of his pictures you actually have to kind of cruise the image to find it but we see in this image we see a lot of women we see many people of color um so in fact what's fascinating for me is working with these archives is actually needing to kind of search through the bias of the image maker himself and find like maybe a deeper truth which is that this beach has been a place for queers queer people of color, and even families. Can we go to the next slide? Here's just another day at the beach. This image I feel like is a little bit later, although again, we don't have the exact details, but it is by Richard Peckinpah. You know, if, you, if you're able to look closely, you just see it's people of all different ages and there's families and it's just it's just a regular day at Reese. It's, it's really no different than today. Next slide. Um, this is another collage that I made, and I really wanted to grapple and kind of address for myself um, my relationship to this beach, which, especially for the last few decades, has been predominantly a beach for people of color. Um, and I, as a white photographer, am, uh, want to acknowledge that and kind of work with that. And um, so, you know, this image, the color image I made on the beach recently, um, and I love it, and I feel like everyone in the image is really um feeling themselves and i wanted to pair that with an image from the 60s and kind of think about my relationship to uh to this beach in the present next slide this is an image by frank hallam from the 80s and you know as a documentarian and photographer and artist i do i oftentimes hesitate making pictures at this beach because i do want to make sure everyone in the image feels good about themselves being photographed uh frank hallam in my experience was less interested in that if you look on the right hand side you can see this little kind of uh black line and that is most likely his like camera strap so he was probably holding the camera down like by his hip and just kind of snapping away and you can also see that there's a lot of nudity at this time this is presumably the early 80s um, and the building again is still in working order. Um, and I'm I'm interested in these, you know, I love looking at these images. I couldn't myself make this kind of an image where I'm just kind of sneaking a picture, but um, as a person interested in the archive, it is very compelling. Next slide. Again, um, this is, you know, there's that house in the background that's been there for a long time. It literally has not changed. Um, a woman raised her family in that house um, and it was recently sold, but it had been in that family's possession for a long time. Uh, so this beach was a place where nudity and children and queerness just 
all converged and seemingly thrived. Next slide. Also, another thing, you know, Kyan and Jai were talking about um, the the things that we want to have at the beach. And at one point, there was actually water access right at the beginning. This is that fence line that is still there today. And there, there was actually like a, a water spot right there. Um, this is images by Richard Peckinpah. So yeah, there's no reason we can't have more of these things happening now. Next slide. Again, you know, I want to make these images with people and I want them to feel like they are able to represent themselves. And I just, I walk around the beach and I see a moment and I just want to capture it. And these were two really sweet people who uh, let me take their picture. And I just, I love this touch that they have with each other and um, that they're looking back towards me. And it's just, this is just a utopia for so much of us. And, and they made these outfits themselves. This is a place where we go to like, give love and get love and carry on the kind of traditions of um of celebrating each other next slide um this was a more spontaneous moment and i just you know in addition to portraits i love kind of capturing these moments when they present themselves anyone who's been to this beach has seen this kind of a moment you know the lifeguards have gone away and it's late in the afternoon and we're just sharing a moment with each other. Um, and I think that's really beautiful. Next slide. Cayenne, this is Cayenne. I had to include you, Cayenne. Thank you for letting me take pictures with you as always. Um, and we had just a wonderful day. This is This beach is an immense place of creative and political output. Uh, I can't tell you just all the names of all the people that I know that have swam on this shore. It's it's profound to think how much creativity and amazing work has been done by the people that call this beach theirs. Next slide. I also started taking long exposure images of the beach. I became more interested in the space of the beach. And of course the, the hospital is such a, a significant part of that. You can see in the pictures at Reese, you know, there's just this look and it's like this open shade look and you don't get that in any other place except for Reese because nowhere else has a building that close to it. And um, so this is really just about uh, the energy that I feel like at the beach that, that that frenetic energy of movement happening. Um, next slide. And of course, I do want to just talk about the importance of this space as um, something similar to a church for many of us. This is a memorial for the beloved Miss Columbia, who we've been talking about a little bit. Um, she passed away several years ago, and we constructed this, this monument to her, and it still stands today. And we began uh, having the Miss Columbia Memorial Beach Walk. And it's a time where we can celebrate and dress up and drag and feel fabulous and just embody for a few hours the spirit that Miss Columbia brought to New York City, particularly to Queens. Um, of love. Um, and so this was the first uh, year that we had the Memorial Beach Walk. We dressed her up and we we had an altar to her. Um, and the next slide, please. And lastly, I do want to just talk about also um, other people of the community. And as a documentary photographer who's been making pictures of Reese for a while, I've gotten to know so many people and become friends with them. And, and it really is this amazing community that kind of disappears a little bit for a few months out of the year and then comes back together and we just pick right back up. And this is a friend of ours, Eddie, who did pass away this year um, and was just such a, a beloved member of the beach. And I just wanted to take a moment to reflect how wonderful it was to get to know him um, in the, the years that we would hang out. and. Um, so yeah, Reese is such a beautiful place and I'm so lucky to be able to photograph there. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, now I'm thrilled to turn things over to Spencer Williams, the director of advocacy at MAS, who will moderate the group discussion portion of this afternoon's program. Thank you so much, Tina. I'd like to welcome all of our panelists to join us back on camera. I'm really struck at the, the power of the presentation today, um, thinking about those three words that Tina led us with, queer trans power. I think you've all spoken to the power of organizing, whether it's ideas, stories, policies, people, 
or even the simple power of organizing people um, to bring all of their full selves into a space and the power and reverence of what that can really bring um, because there are so many places in which that's not accessible uh, in the community, whether it's you're going to rent an apartment and you wonder, should you hold hands with the person that you love? Um, there are all of these threats that are reemerging as well, nationally, federally, on uh, the gay and queer community that I think really make these kind of spaces so much more important. Um, I want to pick up on some themes that came through, um, particularly around reanimating the space. One of the things that we're focused on here at MAS is sort of the question and concept of enduring culture. Sort of what do we do with those more intangible elements of places that are not necessarily physical? I think, Ken, you spoke to this place as being a landscape. Um, Chris, you spoke to this being a sort of church. Um, Jala and others about freedom and stories in these collections. I would love to hear everyone's ideas on sort of what sort of helps define the enduring culture of Rees and the people who are sort of nourished by it. Um, and what do you think we should sort of celebrate as we look to preserve more than just the structure and more than just the activity? So I, I would start. Um, I think. Within my advocacy, definitely um, prioritizing youth, um, elders, also um, black and brown, um, trans body. I think definitely making sure um, that the space is very welcoming, right? Because if you, a lot of a lot of a lot of coming to the beach is word of mouth, right? And depending who you receive that from, it could be in a different experience on what you get when you arrive, right? Um, to having to walk down walk past a whole bunch of straight people and their and their family and their children and then you get to the section and it still feels like home and community so i think like um when building a house i had no idea that we had ownership of the airspace on top right and so having ownership of the whole area the whole area and i and i'm saying like two bus stops right there's one you can stop by the bathroom or one more further down having having ownership also safety um, patrol, patrolling to our area and prioritizing youth, black and brown trans bodies, and also our elders to have space because of a, a lot of us, we don't even prioritize our elders. Um, and so that's what that looks like for me. I will say, you know, coming from two parts of this. So I am, connected to the people that are building the hotel and Roosevelt Island. And they had the glamping for the past two years prior. Um, when I needed accessibility, I was told, well, you can use our bathroom, our private bathroom, which was wonderful. I can use your private bathroom. Then I found out that they were sort of, sort of co-partners in the Rockaways. And I looked at the privilege surrounded around this group and these people. There's a lot of privilege when you have a 60 year lease tied to concessions. That tells me we as people are not being prioritized as people. When offered a public bathroom, your bathroom and not the public bathroom, your private bathroom from your staff, that tells me a black trans woman with a certain amount of privilege if that was the offer to me. But when I suggested, can I bring my community down too? Because that's what I'm gonna do. If we gotta use the bathroom, let's all use the bathroom. We're looking at the direct slap in our face for our community. One coming from people that I know, but right then and there, I asked when found out that they're building a luxury hotel over the bathhouse and yes that's gonna happen while we lose our spot they're gonna build a hotel we must remember this is community this is our community being erased again 
we're looking at high luxury coming in. My request to them was, can at least 10 or 20 units be low income so my community can have access to stay on that land in that hotel? And they were like, we need to get to the board. So in having ownership and us having our spot in the sun, I'm not, I'm not comfortable in Coney Island, never have been. Never have been. I'm not comfortable in Jones Beach. Never have been. We have heard they have been from this. We have heard that there have been several spots for a community. There's one spot, Fire Island, gay white men and tokenized black bodies. Let's be real about that because that's what it is. There's also another part that we have to talk about. No other part of uh, park, no other recreation spot is for us other than Reese Beach. Let's be clear here that that beach is our utopia and there shall be no more unless we create it, we protect it, we have it. Jumping off that, I do want to bring up something that got brought up earlier, which um, feels really important in this conversation is, is accessibility, uh, just in terms of uh, queer spaces oftentimes are a little bit further than the rest of, you know, they're, they're just a little bit down the road, they're the furthest west or the east you can go. We really need to make uh, all beaches and all spaces accessible to folks with disabilities. So we do need, uh, we need like wheelchairs that have uh, like the soft wheels so we can bring our family members to the beach. Everyone deserves to be at this beach. Um, and I do want to also just say that this beach has always been targeted um, as a queer beach, and it has always been resilient. And so it's this, there's this complex relationship between the, ver the vulnerability of spaces, uh, but also the resilience of these spaces. Ken? Um, well, I can speak from the historical perspective and the importance of this space um, in not wanting to create a hierarchy, but if one is to look at Reese Beach, it is one of the most long lasting significant out, outdoor spaces and the importance that everyone is talking about. It's not a commercial space, it's not a residence, it's not a restaurant, it's not a venue, it is an outdoor space and there's something about beaches for the queer community that are um, important. Um, I mean, to celebrate one's sexuality and body and, you know, identify with others there. Um, the conundrum from a preservation project is, you know, here we have city owned property adjacent to federally owned property. The federally owned property, there's the Reese Beach Historic District, it's on the National Register. Um, and even if it was reinterpreted for its queer history, which is something that we've discussed, um, you know, we would have to look at what is the resource. And this is the conundrum with historic preservation and the intangible benefits of this space as a, as a location and destination for queer people and how important it is. Um, but the buildings aren't telling that story, the buildings that are on the city owned property, even though by default they are because of their location, it is what was the sort of impetus for the buildings, you know, the the shrouding of that ne you know nestled area. So, um, you know, I think that the the, the promotion of this space uh, as an important queer landmark is something that should continue going forward. And I think, you know, I, uh, the I think Katie mentioned the the loath loathing the use of the word stakeholders, but you know, there's got to be a big adv advocacy push here um, from various people. Um, to, to talk about it. You know, I'm so glad you said that. Um, for almost two years now, I've been talking to politicians and, and it's been mixed company, but I've also been talking to the Rockaways Home Association and we got some good feedback that they know our history has been there for forever, according to them but also how they talk about the necess their necessities, that mm -hmm. it is a food desert, that it is a transportation desert, 
that, you know, that the accommodations we need on both sides. We do need access to transportation, leaving that area at night. But what has been historical and probably one of the things that hurts me the most is the lack of accessibility, even when it comes down to stuff like internet service, which is a life-saving mechanism. We, right at Pier 1 and Pier 2, internet service cuts off, where you have accessibility for the rest of the beach. Right there at Pier 1 and Pier 2, there are no accessibilities for seniors, for youth, for anybody. And you look at the this vast world of richness. What we're asking for is not, not hard. What we're asking for should be created for us by us because we are the people that are gonna suffer the most. We're the people that a spot is gonna be taken away from while they reconstruct whatever they reconstruct Pier one and pier two is going to be gone. And let's not even talk about the lack of lifeguards in our space. We've lost bodies on that beach because we haven't had lifeguards. The rest of the beach has had lifeguards. I guess we are those forgotten people. Like we're the forgotten people that don't need a bathroom. When they started this project to uh, demolish the beach this year, the first thing they got rid of was the porta potty. Erasure, porta potties, public bathrooms for us to relieve ourselves. Then they started passing out tickets to people that would go on the sides behind the dumpster to relieve themselves, not in the water behind a dumpster, but let's think in a better world of creating in New York City porta potties. You remove them because our access to accessibility is not thought of when creating. Um, I want to see us have those things. I want to see us have a concession stand by us. I want to see us employ our people in the parks department so they have employment sustainability surrounded around a health and wellness center, along with all the court Cassidy that happens in New York City as a Black trans woman. I'm going to need to see some power diverted back to our community, marginalized community, people in need of services and resources, and yes, our utopia, our resort, our Hamptons, our Fire Island, because that's what it is to us. Annie and Katie? Um, I will jump in on what Kayan said about lifeguards. I know that part of what the Parks Department is discussing putting on that plot where the hospital is are updated lifeguard facilities um, with accessibility aspects, um, though I don't know what more they plan to develop there. However, the deed of the land that the hospital is on dictates that that land can only be developed into a park or a city. Um, so for our queer communities to have the most um, power in organizing and to use that word again, communicating with stakeholders, I think we need to be speaking with city health and hospitals, with the um, city parks and rec department, with the national parks. I know that's part of the Gateway Park Service. So these are really the people who have the power to make decisions there. And those are the people who need to be hearing the voices of folks speaking on this soon. And those are the people we're talking to. Glitz has been successful with my partners. As a Black trans woman, I've been terrified to be in these rooms. So my partners, the Abigail Project, have been those white people to do that work for me. They, they also showed up at the Rockaways. I think when anybody sees a Black trans woman step up to the table, especially with the amount of privilege I have, I still scare stakeholders. So I've asked Abigail to be the face of Glitz, the face of Cayenne. Until I'm ready to step out on that platform, I know this world for being prejudiced. I know what it gets. So I am carefully getting white people behind me in community that mean the very most to this work because they need to be in those rooms until I'm ready to be in these rooms. And it's a shame at this day and time, somebody like me can't be at this table and taken serious. 
Katie, do you have anything to add? Sorry. Oh, I, you know, Annie really said it, but there are those deed restrictions in terms of what happens. And I think what gets tricky here is because um, the beach itself is run by the Gateway National Park Service and its federal lifeguards. It's a totally different lifeguard set. You know, the lifeguard um, shack, for lack of a better word, that will be built on the site of the uh, former hospital is actually going to be for the city lifeguards to the left, you know, of the beach. So it sort of gets confusing there. But um, yeah, I know that there will be a lot of discussion, I'm sure, and a lot of community meetings about what gets placed there, but upgraded facilities for everyone, especially with restrooms, which which they've added further down into the city run beaches. I think Probably. one of the slaps in the face for my community is two years ago, we watched two, be, two of our people pulled out the water by our people lifeless bodies because we didn't have lifeguards and oh my god they're building a lifeguard station right where they weren't so you know this show tells us a lot it tells us a lot about erasure it tells us that we have to be in these rooms and we have to have these conversations because these are the very things we need to bring up to health and hospitals the parks the federal parks the, these are the very things that we need to bring to the light while we're lifting this place and rebuilding, there was so many, there've been so many talks over two, three, four years that they were gonna build a, a parking lot, a utility station. So, you know, having these conversations with the Federal Parks Department and Parks and Recreations and Health and Hospitals, it's ideal that we have a health and wellness center connected, connected to this, that we have a park for our children. Think about our children. We like to bring our children. Yes, we have children. Queer people have children. Trans people have children. Let's build a park in front of a health and wellness center so we still protect and preserve our spot, our beach goer spot, because it makes sense because it's humane, because it's giving us the humanity we deserve and giving us the land we deserve because we've occupied it for over five, six, seven decades. Really fabulous. I think what I've heard through your answers is a lot of ownership is part of the enduring culture of the space. The sense of arrival that you are sort of here and that sense of sort of deep belonging that comes from being an intergenerational space that comes from ownership and resources and wellness and power being uh, visible and experienced by the people that come and witness um, for everybody else. Um, that's a really beautiful thing. I think I checking in the Q&A, I would love for you all to sort of let us know where we can find out more about your archival projects or where to find you online. And also if you could give our audience a sort of call to action on sort of what they could do, um, if anything, to show up um, and help bring more power to this effort and to this space. I'll just say one thing from the historic perspective. You know, history matters, continuity of history matters, identity through history matters, and so forth. So if there are stories or archival images um, that one wants to share with the project that we can include, that would be great um, to create this fuller representation of the history. And it's also important when discussing any advocacy and any project like this in New York City to have sort of that synopsis of the history to get, you know, for lack of a better word, credibility that this is an important location. And the biggest fear I have is um, if we look at, you know, the West Side Piers and the Christopher Street Pier, where there were those wonderful buildings that were in disrepair that were sort of <laughs> taken over, those are gone. And that landscape has no history or legibility of the past. And uh, the re-speech, th that is not a, an option in this case at re-speech to have that happen. I wanted to address one uh, of the observations in the Q&A, and I do appreciate that it was brought up specifically, um, and it's actually about Jacob Rees himself, and I just want to amplify that statement that Jacob Rees, um, in his iconic, famous book, he is, he is a celebrated activist, um, but if you read How the Other Half Lives, 
you do see that he also was a racist, anti-Semitic person. Um, and if you ask me, I would love for us to change the name of Race Beach to like Miss Columbia Beach or something, you know, um, because we need to address these issues um, and not just celebrate someone like Reese for these ways that maybe he did contribute to legal uh, changes in tenement conditions, but also he was a, a very flawed human being. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, so definitely, um... Visit our GLITS website. GLITS stands for Gay, Lesbian, Living in a Transgender Society. Um, please sign a petition. Also to our um, to everybody out there, it is definitely important with um, getting permission of communities of color when documenting and taking pictures if they're in the land in, in any view, access our permission. And to our people of color, specifically Black people, make sure that our history is being marked. When you're going to the beach, tag yourself. Um, hashtag yourself so that when these things come out and uh, when, when they're looking through social media and to Comey and, and, and we're talking about documenting our presence on the beach, that we're being seen in droves. Um, and so that is, that is what I can say, continuously showing up, continuously being authentically yourself and continuously let's um, share the space with respect to each other. I just want everybody to show up, show up to the community me meetings, show up to the Rockaways meetings, um, show up to our focus groups, bringing light and knowledge and, and information and Chris's art and Ja, our historian's art, all to the table. Because history, if anything, is all of us. We are monumentally changing the world together. And, and thank you very much, Ken, thank you. You are a loved person for doing this and helping us figure out this picture of what building an historical site could look like. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Go ahead, Amy. Cool. I was just gonna say something that you can, everyone who goes to Reese and hears about Reese and thinks about Reese is in community with folks who love Reese is if you see something you can let a journalist know, obviously ask permission. It depends on what's going on, but my website is in the chat and I will be continuing to cover this demolition and the subsequent fate of the beach and the plot next to it. Um, so please reach out if you hear anything or experience anything. Thank you all so much. I know that we've gone a little over our time today. I wish that we could spend all day together, but I hope to see many of you at the Miss Columbia Walk as well. Um, I would like to extend gratitude to our panelists. Um, really excited to continue to engage with your work. And thank you so much for your time, your ongoing advocacy, and just your power. It's a really beautiful thing to see and um, especially to have you all together in this space. So thank you very much. Uh, I would also like to thank the NAS, NAS staff who helped initiate and coordinate tonight's program. Um, really excited to be having these conversations as an organization, um, as well as to all of those of us who have joined us this evening, um, with a special thanks to our NAS members. Um, if you are not a member and enjoyed today's program, we hope that you would consider joining us. Your membership support helps to make MAS programs and advocacy towards a more livable city possible. Um, see the chat for more information on how to support MAS. In addition, uh, this fall, we're excited to host an array of in-person and virtual events. On Thursday, September 8th, we will host a gallery talk with painter Rick Seekin, the most recent artist featured in our virtual Friedman Gallery. Also, save the date for our 2022 Brendan Gill Prize Ceremony, which will be hosted at the Museum of the Moving Image on Wednesday, September 21st. Check back soon for more details on how to RSVP, plus keep an eye on our events calendar for more fall events and member opportunities that have yet to be announced. Once again, I want to thank you all for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again to the panelists.